Good evening, everybody. It is time for us to get started. Uh, turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 21. <clears throat> Genesis 21. We are reaching the conclusion of Abraham's story. On Thursday, we talked about this episode in chapter 20, uh, where Abraham um, moves down to the southwest corner of Canaan, of the Promised Land, uh, down to this place called Gerar, and uh, has a run-in with the king of that city, Abimelech. Um, And... It sounded awfully similar to stories that we had already read about Abraham uh, because just like with Pharaoh in Genesis chapter 12, uh, in chapter 20, Abraham and Sarah uh, conspire to, to lie to Abimelech. And of course, Abraham tries to defend what he does as, well, does, does Abraham admit that he's told a lie? What's his excuse? Yeah, well, she is my sister. Yeah, um, and of course he's yeah he, he's completely uh, passing over his intent in what he's saying. Technically, it is true that they are half siblings. That's not the reason why he told Abimelech that they were half siblings. Uh, yeah, they they weren't telling Abimelech that they were half siblings because they were interested in Abimelech knowing that, uh, but because they were interested in him not knowing that they were husband and wife. Uh, Abimelech takes Sarah in, and the text tells us that he did not approach her, but the Lord approaches him in the night in a vision, and tells him, "Yeah, you're a dead man." Uh, because you have taken another man's wife. Abimelech protests his innocence, and the Lord says, Yes, I know that you have done this in the integrity of your heart. It was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now then, return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, so that he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not return her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. Right, and a couple of things. Uh, we, we didn't really spend any time on Thursday talking about this, but this is the first time uh, that I can think of in the Bible that someone is identified as a prophet. At the very least, it's someone that's surprising, you know, surprising to us. We don't think of Abraham as a prophet, do we? We typically think of him as a patriarch. You know, that's kind of the label that we stick on him in our heads. And God tells us that he's a prophet, um, and at the very end of this encounter with Abimelech, he tells Abimelech, if you do not return her, know that you shall surely die. All right, and on Thursday, we made a connection between this episode and the other place in Genesis where we have uh, people talking about well, God telling somebody, you shall surely die, which is when? Yeah, back in the garden, dealing with the fruit. Um, And there's this, you know, we drew this connection between the two scenes uh, that this is kind of like a a reprise of the garden in a a a subdued and a smaller sense. Um, Except here, Abimelech is faithful. Whereas Adam and Eve are told, you know, don't touch there, don't eat this, lest you surely die. And by the way, remember, uh, whenever Eve is talking to the serpent uh, and she's repeating the prohibition back, she adds another prohibition on top of it. Uh, She says that God told them not only not to eat of it, but also not to touch it, lest they surely die. Uh, And notice that the whole episode here in chapter 20 is centered on Abimelech touching Sarah. Um, and God doesn't let him touch Sarah. Um, so Abimelech, unlike Adam and Eve, Abimelech is faithful. He listens to God. Uh, and he rises early in the morning to obey the word of the Lord. And he makes everything right. Uh, and of course, 
if we look at this kind of in the cast of the temptation in the garden, uh, where Abimelech is tempted by a forbidden fruit, and unlike Eve, does not touch the forbidden fruit, but instead is obedient to God. Um, where did we say that put Abraham in all of this? What position does that put him in if we're casting this in terms of the temptation in the garden? The serpent. Yeah, which, again, is a surprising turn. You know, the text is not out to propagandize any of the uh, the patriarchs or any of the heroes of faith. Right? Uh, Moses shows us all of their dark spots and does it with some flourish. Right? Again, he's not sweeping any of this under the rug. He's putting Abraham really in the worst possible light in this chapter by inviting us to draw those connections. Um, but what this is going to do uh, is also going to highlight, whenever we see Abraham in a low like this, uh, when he's being faithless, part of what it serves to do is it will really, really highlight when he is being faithful, as we're about to read uh, in chapter 22. All right, so everything ends up being settled out. Abimelech uh, gives Abraham... Uh, sheep and oxen, male and female servants. Uh, he tells Sarah, Behold, I have given your brother... Uh, no, he's, he's, uh, he, can you just imagine the tone of voice he has to be saying that in? I gave your brother a thousand pieces of silver. It is a sign of your innocence in the eyes of all who are with you, and before everyone you are vindicated. Then, at the very end of the chapter, uh, chapter 20, verse 17... Abraham prayed to God and healed Abimelech. Right, this is what God promised, by the way. You know, return the man's wife because he's a prophet. He'll pray for you so that you may live. So Abraham prays to God and God healed Abimelech and also healed his wife and female slaves so that they bore children. For the Lord had closed all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. All right, and we we talked about how at this point in the narrative, this is especially uh, important uh, because Abraham is able just it, to pray to God, and he uh, God opens up all of the wombs of all of these women, Abimelech's whole household, so that they can all conceive children. Uh, and of course, this is especially meaningful in this particular point in the narrative because what still hasn't happened by the end of chapter 20? Yeah, Sarah still has not conceived uh, and we're still waiting on the promise that Abraham has been waiting on for years. All right, remember, he sets out at age 75. At this point, he's nearly 100. He's going to be 100 in chapter 21, the text tells us. Uh, he's been waiting for basically a quarter quarter century. Um, and the Lord still has opened up the wombs of all of these women in Abimelech's household, but has not as yet opened Sarah's womb. Um, so we talked about that on Thursday. What we didn't talk about is kind of how this fits into the broader story in Genesis. Um, it, this is probably something that you've noticed, but stories about barrenness are exceedingly common in the Bible. Right? It names some other famous biblical women who are barren. should be able to rattle off at least a few. Rachel, yeah. Who else? Hannah, good, and Samuel. Uh, what about at the beginning of Luke? Very well, should be very famous barren woman at the beginning of Luke. Elizabeth, yeah, the mother of John the Baptist. Um, the, there's this, this repeated refrain all through Scripture of God giving life to humanity. Uh, and in this particular case, opening wombs so that women can conceive children. Um, and it's, you know, it, it, in Luke 1 at least, it's also tied in uh, whenever Gabriel is talking to Mary, right? So Mary's not barren, but 
Should she be having children at her stage in life? No. <laughs> we, you know, hope not, right? Something's gone wrong uh, if that's the case because she's only betrothed. She's not married yet. Uh, and in fact, she, she tells, she asks Gabriel uh, whenever he says you know, that you're going to give birth to this child, she asks Gabriel, well, how can this be? I'm a virgin. And Gabriel brings up Elizabeth as the example. In fact, let's go to Luke 1. Keep your finger at Genesis 21. Uh, But let's go to Luke 1 real quick. Um, Verse 34. Luke 1.34 And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Remember what God's retort was to Sarah back in the beginning of chapter 18, whenever she laughs in the tent? Remember, God asked, well, why, why did your wife laugh? And Sarah, you know, you got to imagine, she thinks she's like, you know, hiding in secret. Nobody's, you know, heard her. She could, you know, pop her head out. I didn't laugh. He said, no, but you did laugh. And one of the things that God asks um, in verse 14, sorry, Genesis 18, 14, is anything too wonderful for the Lord? All right, basically, the, the same point the Lord is making to Sarah and Abraham is Gabriel is making to Mary. Nothing will be impossible with God. Right? The proof uh, that that she is going to conceive as a virgin is that God is able to allow barren women to conceive. All right? And why this is all such a big, 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 big deal is that in the very beginning. Well, what is God's first commandment to mankind? Go all the way back to Genesis. Yeah. Genesis chapter 1. Now, if we go to verse 26, we'll see that God has some intentions for man that He expresses. Um, before be fruitful and multiply. Genesis 1.26 Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. All right, that's, that's God's intention for man. But as he's not telling this to man. Well, he, he hadn't made man at this point. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, verse 28. And God said to them, God's very first words to humankind, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. The the be fruitful and multiply comes first. And that's the avenue through which God says man will subdue the earth and have dominion over everything. Be fruitful and multiply is the very first commandment. Uh, And then you look at the curses that are laid down. You know, what's, what's the curse given to Eve? In yeah, childbearing. Genesis three verse sixteen to the woman he said, "I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children." All right, and then the other part of that uh, of the curse is, "Your desire shall be for your husband, but he shall rule over you." All right, so the it, this is a big deal all through Scripture. Excuse me. Uh, what God is doing through Abraham here at the end of chapter 20, and what He's doing through Abraham and Sarah, as we're going to see at the very beginning of chapter 21, um, it ties all the way back to the beginning, and it has echoes all through the rest of Scripture. I mean, in fact, if you're reading through Luke 1, uh, the the Annunciation to Elizabeth and Zechariah is you know, they're they're basically a 
uh, a type of Abraham and Sarah, the way that things are uh, are told about them. They're both, you know, so Elizabeth is barren. They're both advanced in years. Uh, they're both righteous. Um, and God comes and makes a promise and keeps the promise. All right, so lots and lots of echoes of this text all throughout Scripture. All right, so that brings us up to our text for tonight, chapter 21. Now let's bow together in prayer. Righteous Father, thank you for the many gifts that you've given us tonight. Thank you for our time together to study from your word. And Father, I pray that as we study about your servants, Abraham and Sarah, uh, that we learn, Father, uh, your will for your people. Uh, Father, you reveal to us who you are as our God and who we are to be as your children, as your people. Uh, Father, uh, grant us uh, your grace that we may be more faithful servants in your kingdom. Thank you for the gifts that you've given us in your Son. It's in his name that we offer our prayer. Amen. Alright, Genesis chapter 21. Hmm? 21. Yeah, we we didn't study 21 on Thursday. Yeah, we're not quite up to 22 yet. Oh, okay. Uh, Genesis 21. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Alright, so finally in the text, God's promise is fulfilled. And it's, it, I don't know, I find it kind of funny, the, just the really simple, unadorned way that Moses expresses this. There's not a whole lot of fanfare about it once it finally happens. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. And what's the emphasis at the end of each one of those sentences, basically? Yeah, as God said. He does exactly as He says. He visited Sarah as He had said. He did to Sarah as He promised. Uh, she conceived and gave Abraham a son at the time of which God had spoken to him. All right, so God is keeping all of his promises. Sarah conceived, she bears him a son at the promised time. God is faithful. And then notice what we read next. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac. Now, why did he do that? By the way, why was Isaac his name? Well, there's the bit about the laughing. We'll we'll come back to that because that's going to be important for this chapter. But that's not the basic reason. You know, there's um, it's it's connected. But the reason why uh, Abraham calls the name of the son Isaac is simply God said his name will be Isaac. Right? Whenever God's promising the son. Um, he says that Sarah is going to bear you a son and you shall call his name Isaac. And that's it. So Abraham does as God told him. Right? Look at what, uh, what he does next. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Alright, so it, here the text makes it explicit. Why did he circumcise Isaac on the eighth day? Because it's what God told him to do. So the first four verses of the chapter, uh, this picture of an ideal covenant relationship between God and His people. God is faithful. He keeps His promises. He keeps His end of the covenant. And in response, God's people are faithful and they keep their end of the covenant. Uh, And this this is what covenant living is supposed to look like. 
Right? God keeps His promises for His people. God's people obey God and do as they have promised. By the way, how often do we see this sort of thing happening in Scripture? You know, how representative of the whole history of God's people are these four verses right here in Genesis 21? Not at all. Most of the rest of Scripture... Uh, I mean, just think of what we've read in Genesis up to this point. Um, most of the rest of Genesis, most of the rest of Scripture does not look like this. You know, God's always keeping His promises, but man is rarely keeping His promises. Man is rarely being obedient. So, this is, this is a high watermark here. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Okay, and yeah, we've, we've talked about this before. That the name Isaac, you know, like all Hebrew names, has some significance to it. Um, so the, the Hebrew word, Tzachak, which I know is super, super phlegmy. Uh, this is like a, a T-S. It, it's, some Hebrew names are like really hard to pronounce. Um, so you would spell this like T-S-A-C-H-A-Q, which resembles like no English word in existence, right? Um, that means he laughs. And Isaac's name is merely, you stick a Y in front of it, essentially. Um, and it also means he laughs, just a different form of the word. Um, we have it so much easier in English. We just get to say Isaac. In Hebrew, it's Yitzchak, or Yitzchak. Sorry, the, I put too hard of a K in the middle. Chak. So you get that phlegm in the middle and the hard K sound at the end. Yitzchak. Um, I'll stick with Isaac. Um, so the name signifies the laughter. We talked about this back in chapter 17, chapter 18, because Abraham and Sarah, they both react to this news that God is going to bear, uh, He's going to give Abraham a son through Sarah. Uh, they both react by laughing. Uh, and in fact, you know, we, sometimes we focus more on Sarah's laughter because God you know, calls her out for it. Um, but honestly, whose laughter was worse? Well, you look at Abraham, he falls down on his face laughing. Which, when you think of him as a prophet, it's especially startling. right? Because how do the prophets always respond to being approached by the Lord God? They always fall down on their face, right? You think of, like, you think of Daniel, at the end of Daniel, you think of John, at multiple points in the book of Revelation. Uh, the, the, the strength of the Revelation just hits them so hard they just fall down in worship. Just, you know, can't help themselves. They're not flat on their faces. Um, hmm? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it happens every time that somebody encounters the Lord in that close proximity that a prophet does. And yet here, the prophet Abraham falls on his face because he's laughing at God's promise. All right, that's supposed to be incredibly astonishing to us. Uh, so Abraham has laughed, Sarah has laughed, and here, their laughter has changed. All right, whereas in chapter 17 and 18, their laughter was obviously the laughter of disbelief. Like, there's, what do you, who do you think I am? What kind of chump do you think I am to believe that something like that is going to happen? Right, that is changed now. They're no longer laughing in disbelief. Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. There's, there's still that element of, you know, who to thunk it, right? Um, they obviously didn't. But now that it's happened, uh, 
Uh, honestly, I'm not sure what what word to put to it. The kind of joy that you feel when you're still kind of in disbelief that something really, really good has happened to you. I'm sure there's a, a word for that. Uh, but that seems to be what Sarah's got going on here. Uh, so God has transformed their laughter from the laughter of disbelief into the laughter of joy. And the child Isaac is a... uh, He testifies to that um, basically eternally, right? Because Isaac... Well, we could say that Isaac is dead. Jesus would disagree with us, by the way. Remember, he tells the Sadducees, God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Right? Jesus was telling the Sadducees, who disbelieved in resurrection, Isaac is still alive. Right? Isaac is an eternal testimony uh, to this work that God does in his people. Right? This, this laughing, this change in the laughing, uh, encapsulates, I think, what is supposed to happen to somebody in their covenant relationship with God. God makes promises. God's people think that His promises are too good to be true. And that God is faithful and He keeps His promises. And in the end, all that we're left with is incredible joy. Uh, joy that can only be summed up, as Sarah says, as laughing. God has made laughter for me. Uh, and Isaac's name is a testimony to this change that God makes in His faithful. All right, so this is the this is the really really good part of chapter twenty one. Excuse me, uh, this is the happy part of chapter twenty one. Any questions or comments before we move into the next part of chapter twenty one? All right, verse eight. And the child grew. And was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, laughing. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the child under one of the bushes. Then he went out, sorry, then she went out and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, let me not look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Up, lift up the boy, and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water, and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. (coughs) Okay. In some ways, this story should be familiar to us, um, because this is not the first time that we've seen Hagar out in the middle of nowhere crying out to God. This is not the first time that we've seen God approaching Hagar. Um, Let's go back to the beginning of the the section. So this division between Isaac and Ishmael finally comes to a head. Uh, Up until this point, ever since the beginning of Sarah's scheme, and we can't forget, by the way, whose idea this was. 
you know, it's Sarah's scheme at the beginning of chapter 16 to have Abram uh, take Hagar and have her bear a son. Uh, and from there all the way up to this point, there's been this tension because Abraham is perfectly satisfied with uh, letting Ishmael be his heir. And Sarah and God are not satisfied with that. Right? They basically have to team up on Abraham from time to time um, and tell him it's not going to be so. All right, so it all comes to a head at this point, and it finally reaches its conclusion, in, in a sense. Uh, and Ishmael is sent off. The occasion for this, in verse 8, the child that is Isaac grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. Um, and it might seem exorbitant to us to throw a feast on the day that a child is weaned. Uh, it, remember, in the ancient world, you know, child mortality is very, very high. Right? Um, and so from what I've read, it's not uncommon for you know, someone of means to throw a feast for a child being weaned. Uh, because it's during those first you know, two or three years of life that the child is most at risk of dying. Um, so basically this is a celebration. Hey, he survived to be you know, a toddler. Right? Um, and in the midst of this feast... Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, laughing. <clears throat> this is the triggering event right here. Sarah sees Ishmael laughing. All right, and sometimes, and I've heard, I've heard different arguments about this, that the, the particular form of the word that's being used here signifies laughing. Or not, not just regular laughing, but mocking. Or even, you know, regular and frequent, you know, persistent mocking. Yeah, Wayne? She always Yeah, and that's... Um, I mean, it's a matter of interpretation for the form of the word that's being used. It's still the same basic word, sahak. Um, slightly different form of a different prefix at the beginning. And it might imply that. Um, it could imply that there was, yeah, he was always making fun of him. It could imply mocking. The basic meaning, though, is laughing. Right? We're supposed to see the connection between what Ishmael is doing here and who Isaac is. Right? So if your translation says something about mocking, don't lose sight of that. Uh, that it's, we're supposed to see the connection between the laughing of Ishmael and the laughing of Sarah. You know, the laughter that Isaac is. Wayne? Mine says that Hagar was one of those two of them, uh, making fun of her son. I don't think that's borne out in the text. It's it's Ishmael who's doing the laughing. Yeah. See, mine is kind of different in a lot of different ways. It depends on, I guess, the current trend that's going on. Yeah. Well, there's. Yeah. Well, and sometimes sometimes translation can be pretty tricky because, like, if you're looking. Not to spend too much time on this, but if you look down at, say, verse 14, uh, the ESV that I'm reading out of says, So Abraham rose early in the morning, took bread and a skin of water, gave it to Hagar, putting, on a, putting it on her shoulder along with the child. All right, so what all went on Hagar's shoulder? Water, bread, and the child. In English it sounds that way. It's, it's, not, it's not that way. Yeah, the boy was a teenager. If you know, Caroline's only like seven, and I tell her, you know, if she if she wants to be carried, that's just a flat no. You know, <laughs> you know, Ishmael by this point is in his teens, and the mama carry me through the wilderness. You know, no. The this is just the our English translators being a little too wooden with the translation uh, because they're, they're translating it in the same word order in which it appears in the Hebrew. And for us, that makes it confusing. It makes it look like 
like Ishmael is being carried by Hagar. Uh, but what the text is actually telling us is that Abraham gave water and bread uh, to both Hagar and Ishmael. Yeah, they're they're both carrying, and uh, and Abraham sent them away. All right, so yeah, sometimes sometimes our translations can get a little wonky. Um, let's see. All right, so Ishmael is laughing. Again, you know, whether it's out of mocking or whatever, at the very least, like if we're um, you know, if we're reading this in a translation that says laughing, uh, or if we're reading this in the Hebrew, the connection is supposed to be apparent to us. It's supposed to make us see the connection between Ishmael and Isaac. Um, and Sarah sees this connection. Right? Who's supposed to be the source of laughter? It's supposed to be Isaac. Right? And yet here is Ishmael laughing. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son. For the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And this is the threat right here. This is the connection between the two of them. Is that they legally they both are heirs. Um, and Sarah doesn't want Ishmael having any share of Isaac's inheritance. Um, and she immediately, it just even in the way that she talks about, at the very least, the way she talks about Hagar, cast out this slave woman with her son. Who is the slave woman? You know, I mean, you know, besides Hagar, well, what's her status really? It, yeah, she was one of Sarah's maid servants. And the language, you know, back whenever we first read of her in chapter 16, you know, the language that's used of her, um, she's not given to Abraham as a slave. Uh, she is given at the end of chapter 16, verse 3, she's given to Abram as a wife. Right? She's, you know, legally she's supposed to have second wife status. Right? Legally, she's not supposed to be, at least not Abraham's slave. Uh, but Sarah is using this, this language here to cast some distance between them. This slave woman. Cast her out. And by the way, and, and I'm not sure how much we're supposed to make out of this, uh, the, the verb that's used here, cast out, is the same word that's used of Cain. Um, whenever he is cast out, and set wandering in the land of Nod. Sarah wants him cast out so that he doesn't inherit, so that this connection will no longer be there. Abraham is displeased, but the Lord comes to Abraham and agrees with Sarah. Be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. And here God mirrors Sarah's language... And he even takes it a step further uh, by referring to Ishmael. Notice, by the way, neither Sarah nor God at this point have referred to either Hagar or Ishmael by their names. The slave woman and her son cast them out. God says, be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. And the term that God uses here for boy in verse 12 um, Again, you know, Ishmael is a teenager. It's not meant to imply, you know, young child, uh, young man. Uh, it's it's meant to be more of a status marker that is also supposed to cast some distance between Abraham and Ishmael. He doesn't refer to Ishmael as your son. He refers to him as the boy. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For through Isaac shall your offspring be named. God gets really specific. We've noted how over the course of the text, God has gotten more and more specific with the promises. You know, I'll give you lots of offspring. To, you know, I'm going to give you children. To, I'm going to give you children through Sarah. 
All right, I'm going to give you a son through Sarah. This time next year, his name is going to be Isaac. All right, he gets really, really specific. And here he gets even more specific. You know, because technically there could still be some wiggle room in Abraham's mind. Yeah, I can have heirs through Ishmael and Isaac. And God here lays it out for him crystal clear. It's only through Isaac. Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This is going to be really important for the next chapter, by the way, that God is getting this specific. Alright, this removes any possibility that Ishmael is going to compete with Isaac, um, either for inheritance or in Abraham's mind. It removes any possibility that Abraham can think of Ishmael as an insurance policy, so to speak, you know, in case anything... Because look, you know, uh, Isaac is two or three years old, you know, he's just been weaned, um, and... Uh, it could be, again, the mortality rate is still high, right? Abraham could still think of Ishmael as an insurance policy in case something happens to Isaac. And God says, no, we're not going to have any of that. Do what Sarah says. Now, what is Abraham's response? So, Abraham rose early in the morning... All right, we noted this last chapter when Abimelech did the same thing. Abimelech rose early in the morning, uh, showing that he is he's being obedient, and if not necessarily like you know chipper about it, you know it, 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 eager in that way, um, he's he's not dawdling about it, right? He's doing it right away. Abraham rose early in the morning, took bread and a skin of water, gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Right, when the water in the skin was gone, she put the child under one of the bushes. And she sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, Let me not look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy. Alright, this is... You know, this I think it kind of stands out to us in our English text. It's Hagar who's crying, and yet whose voice does God hear, according to Moses? Ishmael's voice. Do I remember what Ishmael means? Ishmael means God hears. Yeah, God hears. Yeah, Yeshema El. You know, El is the, the word for God. Uh, Shema is here. You know, like hero Israel, Shema Yisrael. Um, God hears Ishmael. And the angel of the Lord called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Up, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. All right. So Hagar and Ishmael go wandering through the wilderness on their way to becoming a great nation. Does that story sound familiar to us? Yeah, because that's that's basically the story of Israel. Again, it, Moses does some really interesting things with Hagar and Ishmael. We noted back whenever we saw her running off in chapter 16, how it's interesting, she is faithful and receptive and open in ways that, say, like Adam and Eve are not. Right? God asks her, what are you doing? And she just says what she's doing. She doesn't try to hide it. You know, whereas uh, whenever Adam and Eve hear the voice of the Lord and He asks them what they're doing, they both, you know, they, they try to hide what they're doing. They, they give Him an answer, but it's not really an answer to His question. And He has to call them out. All right, here again, we're given a really, honestly, kind of weird description of Hagar and Ishmael because we know that they're not the chosen ones. We know they're not the chosen people, but God's still going to make them a great nation. And here they are wandering into the wilderness, uh, and uh, they're going to become a great nation. And what stops them in the wilderness? Lack of water. Again, does that sound familiar? They cry out to the Lord in the wilderness because they have no water. 
You know, does that sound familiar? The, the Lord answers them and provides them water. Again, it, you know, here in just a few verses, we're basically given a foreshadowing of the wilderness wandering. Um, except here we don't have Hagar and Ishmael grumbling against the Lord or making a golden calf. Uh, this is, in fact, I think if you're part of Moses' original audience hearing this story, this particular part of the story I think ought to sting a little bit. Um, depending on, you know, if you're hearing it after Israel has committed all of their sins in the wilderness. <clears throat> Excuse me. And God hears Ishmael. Again, signifying the boy's name, Ishmael. Uh, and God repeats his promise yet again to Hagar I will make him a great nation. Mm hmm. Uh, back in chapter 16, uh, that it was, I, I think the way that the text invites us to see it, it, it obviously a mistake. Yeah. Um, that by the end of chapter 16, um, Sarah's goal at the beginning of chapter 16 has gone completely unmet. Everything is blown up. Um, and in fact, it's, it's Sarah's decision in chapter 16 that even creates this tension, this threat that another son could share in her own son's inheritance. Right. Uh, he, if I remember right, the Lord does not directly address Abram and Sarai in chapter 16 about this. Yeah. He only directly addresses Hagar in chapter 16. And in doing that, he makes her great promises in the same way that he made Abram great promises. Um, so the text tells us it was a mistake. The Lord himself doesn't come out and say to Abram and Sarai, Hey, you bunch of dummies, why'd you do that? Um, so, good question. Any other questions before we wrap up here? Wayne? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see a lot of the same things happening over and over again. Yeah, and what really, I think what really makes it interesting is that you're supposed to notice the differences between, well, what happens whenever this group of people does this versus what happens whenever this person does this? You know, Hagar and Ishmael kind of set the model here for wilderness wandering. Um, and later, Israel is going to fall way short of that, right? Okay, good question, good, uh, good comment. Anything else before we wrap up? All right, thank you so much for your kind attention, uh, your questions, and your comments this evening.